Hey, welcome to another video in the Viking Stories lecture series. And this time I'm uh, off to go a little bit further back in history, but it, this is about the roots of the Vikings, the secrets of the Germanic tribes. I know it may sound a little bit, um, well, strange perhaps, but I'll tell you, uh, I could have made a video just about the Germanic tribes, but so many other people have done this here on YouTube. And I have something to contribute, something special connections that I, as a historian, see. And I've also been working with DNA, um, and I am a little bit working with DNA on different projects about this. So further out in the video here, I want to share some of that DNA also. And before I continue and get on to the slides, which is what I do in this lecture series, I just want to point out um, that I promised a lot of my uh, contributors, and thank you to all of you, my patrons, some exclusive content, and I've started uploading this now, so you can check out the patron page, link below. I'd very much appreciate it, and um, and I might see you there. We're sort of like a clan there, clan members, and I've uh, uploaded some uh, bonfire stories, which is sort of like late night tales from uh, my previous expedition life, hunting out for DNA and uh, other stuff like that. Well. Let's get right to it now. I'll share my screen here now with you. The secrets of the Germanic tribes. Let's get started. I, I put up a couple of photos here, but that's just because Netflix just put out the barbarians, right? It's a, uh, uh, it's kind of cool. It's uh, very interesting that uh, this is a German production. Um, and it's all about Germanic tribes fighting against the Roman Empire and winning. So uh, there are many parallels to today and the EU and stuff like that. Um, I recommend the series. I think it's kind of cool, but it's uh, in many ways also a horrible <laughs> um, portray, portrayal of um, the Germanic tribes and how they lived. So just bear that in mind. But it's not too bad all in all. First off. If you want to start talking about um, something about Germanic tribes, we got to understand something in Northern Europe and especially in Scandinavia. And um, the timeline here is, is uh, in history. This is um, KYA. That's uh, that's thousand years ago, right? Two thousand years ago, four thousand six eight, and then you got the Ice Age over here, right? And and uh, on the top here is the Iron Age, Bronze Age, and Neolithic and Mesolithic. But the thing is this was made in the 19th century as distinctions to separate different periods for archaeologists. And as I will show you, there are subgroups to this, and it's quite confusing for a lot of people and uh, also historians. And uh, I think now we are viewing time more and more in a broader manner. And uh, these um, distinctions here are more to uh, a hindrance I would say in understanding history. And this is what I want to show you here now also, because we got to understand the Nordic Bronze Age. All right, it was um, 3,700 years ago, it started in Scandinavia, a bit later and further down south in Europe. And it lasted almost until 500 BC, 2,500 years ago. Um, I, I would like just like you to understand in the blue here below, with respect to the numbers, actually, I'm going to uh, take the sentence before here. The people of the Nordic Bronze Age were actively engaged in the export of amber and imported metals in return, becoming expert metal workers. With respect to the number and density of metal deposits, the Nordic Bronze Age became the richest culture in Europe during its existence. And they had, this, uh, there's a lot of new research coming out of this. It's really, really cool. And, and the... Uh, Archaeologists and other researchers are now finding, finding um, connections in the copper and the tin, which you needed to make uh, bronze, uh, not just to, to Cornwall in England, but down to both present-day Spain and, and uh, Italy and Austria. And they had these massive trading networks, and they traveled a lot along trading routes. We know that. And as I already show you, um, there is a connection here in understanding that this was a very rich age, which uh, a lot of things happened here. In the blue here, I made a blue circle here. That's when the Indo-European migration started coming into Europe and something happened um, 
in, in this era, which is quite important to understand that most archaeologists and historians and geneticists, uh, geneticists, they, well, we don't understand everything at all, uh, especially in the Bronze Age and the transition to the early Iron Age. There was a collapse there. A, uh, yeah, so it makes it a little bit difficult to see and understand, but we're learning a lot now. Here you can see the archaeological cultures of Northern Europe in the late pre-Roman Iron Age, and this doesn't tell us uh, all that much, except for the orange here, which is Celtic, Celtic, right, Gaelic, uh, and 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 the Germanic, as I will show you, that was a term uh, that came later. Um, so, I, is it right to call people in the early pre-Roman Iron Age for Germanics? I don't know. I'll, I'll show you in a bit. Also, here later on, you have the Goths and how the Goth, Gothic migrations would come out of Scandinavia, and and. Um, as you may know, uh, Götaland, Gotland, and, and uh, even some people claim that Jylland, uh, because of the double L, was called Jutland, and uh, the J at the time was, called, was a G, so it, it, the Goths might have well, this is, <laughs> might have well been uh, Gotland here also. And that means that um, not only the Angles and the Saxons came into England, the Utes also went there. And these, well, maybe they were all the Goths in the early uh, times because Goths is the first mentioned by far by Piteas uh, 2,320 years ago about um, on um, as uh, a people uh, from the north when he went to visit Tula. And uh, I'll get to that in just a second. Let's start with some linguistics here. This is a uh, linguistic, uh, well, a, a language tree. You can see the Indo-European branch and the European branch and the Germanic romance. And, and um, the, the Vikings had a lot to, to say in the spread of this, actually, especially for the, for the English. And, and the, you see the French and Lombard here is on the other branch. Um, but all of this is very important in understanding a little bit about linguistics. And, and uh, what we need to understand, because we're coming here, this is what most people know about in terms of Germanic tribes. They've been to Wikipedia, and I've put... I, just so you know, I always do this in the lecture series. I put on a lot of links below and I would like people to read up if they wish to. So that's why I use Wikipedia a lot. So it's easy to follow up on this uh, talk. The invasions of the Roman Empire. This is in the Roman period and in the migration period. And as you can see here, the Goths coming down here. I've actually been down here looking for Goths on Crimea and Azov, and I found something really interesting. And I'll put up something really soon now on the Patreon page. But also there's coming a video from that uh, expedition because I got a lot of cool footage from there. And the research is very interesting as well. So the Huns here, they came from the east, but except for them, you have the Ostrogoths, which was a Gothic tribe. You have the Vandals. Look at how much the Vandals went. And they ventured down into the Atlas Mountains here also, where you can find uh, remnants of that. That's also something I posted yesterday on Patreon, by the way. And the Franks, they didn't travel far, and they expanded from there. The Utes, Angles, and Saxons, that was a bit later in this uh, map here. And, and uh, of course, there are other um, mentions of tribes that I'm getting to real quick. But I want to, as I've done previously, I, I, I want to really emphasize the um, first migrations out of Scandinavia. As you can see in red here, the settlements before 750 BC. And this was after the Bronze Age collapse. And I suspect there were a lot of migrations after that. Could have been plague, could have been warfare. Uh, we don't know yet. And, uh, but there, there was there's a period here, sort of like the Dark Ages of Europe, which was after the Justinian plague in the sixth century. Um, there's a discontinuity here. And that's difficult to see through, to understand. It, it creates a lot of confusion on how these um, people uh, traveled or migrated. So this is actually a linguistic map of the spread of the Germanic, what became the Germanic languages. And there is also one later here in the first and second century AD with the early East Germanic uh, expansions going down through Poland uh, here and, and down towards uh, Crimea, actually, or the Black Sea area. And eventually, this is during the Viking Age. Here you can see the spread of the same Germanic languages, right? You see down at Crimea, you have the Crimean Gothic, 
which we actually find traces of in the 16th century even. That's why I went down there. And on the rivers of, uh, of Russia among the Rus Vikings. You can see the other uh, Rus Vikings, uh, actually, if you want to, uh, well, where I talk a lot about that. And uh, here you have an early, uh, this is AD 1, so 2,000 years ago about. And, uh, and here you can see the different linguistic um, um, divisions of languages, you can say. Uh, North Germanic, North Sea Germanic, and, and, and East Germanic. And um, these were all uh, by linguistics, in linguistics, they were labeled Ingvanok, Ingvanok uh, which means uh, the clan of Ingve. Um, as, as something, well, it's from the 19th century anyway, but um, I wish the colors here were aligned because it would be cool. Maybe I should change that, though I don't know how to. Anyways, let's go from these timelines and the linguistics to the first um, recorded person to travel to Scandinavia. And I know a lot of you who sees this now will say, well, Pythias, he went to Thule. All right, we know this. We haven't his writing, but we have people writing about his travels three centuries later. Um, but uh, I see a lot of people speculate on where Thule was. Well, he went to see the midnight sun. He saw ice and a lot of other stuff. There is no doubt in my mind that he went up uh, from the Orkney and uh, Shetland uh, uh, islands and up to uh, where actually my family is from up here and further north. Now, I mentioned Piteas because it's recorded that he went from Marseille, Mas Massalia, as you see down there in the map. He went up north to see where all the trading goods came from. And this is important because they had all these exclusive, really valuable trading goods down there in, in present day Marseille. And of course, they were, a lot of people wondered where did this amber come from? Because that was in the Baltic Sea, right? The northern coast of Denmark, like here and into the Baltic, along the Baltic coastline. Uh, but there were also a lot of other interesting uh, trading goods that came down. And trade is something that hasn't been focused on a whole lot. It's been really undercommunicated among historians and, and uh, scholars for many decades but that's that's actually changed now in the past few years and i'm very happy for that because uh, we see from dna now wherever there was where trading routes people migrated also there's a larger mix of genes so to say and i believe piteas he went down from here he went straight east instead of down back along the coastline here it's very dangerous to sail here and at this early I mean, uh, the, um, as, uh, as I will show in my next video about uh, the Vikings in the Bronze Age, I'm not going to call it that, by the way, but uh, um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. That'll be next week uh, because uh, it's interesting with these boats they had in Scandinavia in the early Bronze Age, they were really large, lots of people on them, but they wouldn't have brought trading goods down here. It's far too dangerous to sail with lots of um, valuables abroad. It's much easier to take this well-known trading route that went straight through to Sweden. It was up a valley here and then down on the rivers to the Baltic Sea and then down to the amber route. And I'll show you something about that just now. The amber trade and amber roads, these were very important in the Roman period. And you can see where people um, traveled down um, with trade uh, to the Roman Empire here, and, and if you can continue on downwards, I'll show you the uh, European Amber Road. This is made by a uh, Polish historian, so it's a little bit um, focused on that, but it's interesting because this is from the Baltic, right? And here, the trading goods, goods from Scandinavia, which they didn't have in the other place, uh, what you got from Seal and, and, and Val Valros, the tusks. And, and lots of skin, very, very valuable, uh, along with amber, all went down there. So that's, of course, why Piteas went up to present-day Norway, and I'm sure he went down here also along the existing trading routes at the time. And this is a good time to talk about this map, because this is um, 
a map of the Nordic area showing the central settlement regions of the Roman Iron Age and migration period. The map I showed you earlier with all the different migrations, as you saw. Well, the richest areas of Scandinavia you can find here in green. And I'll do this also. The reds, uh, everything red is, is my, and, and black uh, are, are my notes. But here you can see how the trading goods would come down. And you can see, you saw it in the Viking Age. Uh, there were very wealthy people up here with all the, the ones who controlled the trade here, controlled the kingdom of Norway, basically. But um, after this Roman period, after the migration age, when the boats got bigger, they could sail with trading goods this way. And the whole of trade of Northern Europe changed towards the Frisians and the Franks. And this is called the Merovingian period in Norway and, uh, and Denmark. But so this is before this. And this has been very much under communicated. I just talked uh, both yesterday and today with this uh, professor of, uh, of history in, in, uh, in Trondheim in Norway. And he's, uh, he agrees, you know, it's uh, uh, this needs to come out more in light because it's very, you can understand a lot more about history of Northern Europe and Scandinavia if you know this. And if you know how valuable these uh, trading goods were. And that's when you come to this map because, um, I mean, there were of course opportunist people here who traveled <laughs> in, in, in tribes and groups, but uh, what was the incentive? Why did they travel out the way they did? Uh, did trade have a lot to do with it? Did control, did uh, uh, tension with the Roman Empire, as we see later with Charlemagne, who tried to Christian people in Scandinavia, and this caused the Viking Age? Um, it's, it's difficult to say. And here's an early uh, depiction of how it looked in Scandinavia, the island Skansa. And, and you see the Rugi here, I'll talk about them very quick, very soon. And the Herulir here, those are very interesting because we know they lived and had a kingdom in the Balkans. They were really instrumental in taking down the Roman Empire and, and fighting both alongside the Goths and, the, and, and assimilating probably into them. But many probably returned because we know they had good relations with Scandinavia for centuries after they left Scandinavia. And we know this because we have a source in around 550 who records that in, I think, year 512 or something, they, they lost the king in the Balkans. And they went back to Scandinavia to find a, uh, a new king of the same bloodline. And, uh, and they did. And they went down uh, with a group of his men. And this guy died in present-day Germany. And then they returned to Scandinavia to get his brother or something, another in the same bloodline, and went down to the Balkans with their new king. So there you see how, I mean, that's very telling about how important maybe uh, relations with Scandinavia were at the time. And, and I think it says something about trade as well, perhaps. And we shouldn't forget the Svebi um, because it's not on the map here. And the Svebic migrations, Svevi, Svebi, this is very similar to the Sveonis, the early mentions of the, well, what became Swedes, uh, essentially. That's my inter interpretation in any sense. But they went and settled and managed to hold the kingdom here while the Vandals were down here and while the Visigoths came also. And as I will show you in the DNA section, this people living here, and I got many subscribers here. Hi to you all who are from this area or have um, DNA or heritage from this area from this, and, and have taken their DNA samples and it has some connections to Northern Europe and Scandinavia, well, it's probably the Swebi or the Visigoths or the Vandals, perhaps. So uh, we shouldn't forget the Rugi. They were also very instrumental in taking down the Roman Empire. They fought for these uh, Roman, sorry, did I say Roman? I meant Germanic warrior tribes and, and really helped out in these essential years up to 476 and up to when Theodoric the Great would conquer um, present-day Italy and, uh, and uh, have his uh, kingdom down there, which lasted for some time before he had problems with the Byzantines in the Gothic Wars of the 6th century. Rugi, Rugalan, they still call that today, Rugalan, or actually they have just changed, uh, well, well, not, not Rugalan, but uh, they called it Vestland now. Horder, Haruder, that was another one who you have find connections down in uh, Hartz, this area close to where Blocksberg, Blocken uh, is. 
perhaps it's unproven yet. Maybe the DNA we might be able to do that. But they've changed the name now for Hodde. It's been the name in this area of Norway for well probably two thousand years, and they just changed it for administrative reasons. Um, part of new public management. I love that. <clears throat> But the Rugi, they are uh, very uh, have a very distinct culture to, even today in Norway, and and uh, I don't know, it's is it how old, how far does it go back? Well, we don't know, but we do know we find a lot of traces about the Rugi going really far back. And Romerike, it's still called there in Romerike today. It's a very interesting area, and uh, and as I shown you in the, um, this. Uh, um, it is, is Sicily, was it called? Sicily and the, and the Mafia, uh, Normans, Vikings in Sicily. Uh, this other lecture video I had, I, I showed this here about the Lombard migration south of Scandinavia and DNA has now proven uh, connections to Sweden and Norway with, the, with the, uh, these Lombards who settled and had yeah. such a legacy together with the Normans in, um, in, in Italy. So let's get to the DNA. Am I going too fast now? I, I hope not, but um, uh, as I said, I'll put the links down below here so you can check that out also if you wish. Look at this. This is, uh, I'm going really far back in history now in time, um, back to the start, or actually we are the very early start of the Bronze Age, we can say. And half of Western European men descended from one Bronze Age king. And I'll explain some of this in another video that I'm working on um, because I've been to Central Asia and collected DNA there and about the um, sort of like a search for an Indo-European homeland. It was very interesting. The DNA is really cool and there's coming a lot more out also and it's been a revolution for the past six years about this and if you know how these tribes worked because we need to understand that also in terms of the Germanic tribes their roots, and how is it possible that one man can have so many descendants? Well, the thing is, you still find that today in the clan culture, the very strong clan, um, clan culture in Central Asia, which is similar, very much the same roots as we had in Scandinavia, as the Gaelic clans also, and the Irish clans, uh, and Scottish clans. And, and, um, and, and the whole point was they spread out their genes in a very intriguing way. The, they, they had this... Um, uh, what's it called? We call it harem in, in the Nor Norwegian, uh, where you have uh, many, many concubines from all different regions around in your realm, your empire, right? And like Genghis Khan had that. And whenever you have sons with these concubines, they're raised in the court and then they're sent back to where their mother um, were from. And, and there they would have their own concubines uh, who, and whenever they had sons, the sons would grow up in their court and they would go out. And, and this is a perfect mathematical way of spreading your genes very, very effectively. And you can see that very, very easily if you talk to uh, nomads in present day Kazakhstan, for example, and they talk about their family heritage. It's basically the same clan type of talk that we have in Norway when we meet the person from the same place that uh, my mother is from, for example, we don't know the surnames and everything, which family lines and stuff like that, but we don't use the word clan or tribe uh, here in Norway, but they do in Kazakhstan. And, and, uh, and you'll understand if you spend time with them, how this was possible. And this one also, the arrival of the Beaker folk changed Britain forever, ancient study. DNA study shows, and, and listen to this, at least 90% of the ancestry of Britons was replaced by a wave of migrants who arrived about 4,500 years ago. That's what DNA shows, and that's the start of the, or what kicked off the Bronze Age. So here we have a lot of Indo-European migrations coming in. It could have been plague or something before, like with the Islamic, um, the spread of Islam. Um, because of the Justinian plague, it could have been, but still 90% of all, and this is, we're talking about men here. So there were only 10% left in a very short period of time. And all the women had, of course, um, those who survived this uh, would, would have children with the European uh, arrivals. Um, and we see this also in another place, which is very, very telling. Let's go to Iberia, present day, um, Spain and Portugal. So uh, I'll put this map on the left here. This, these are two different studies, but it's really, really cool. Um, 
first to the right here, a history of the Iberian uh, Peninsula as told by its skeletons. Uh, and this link is below also. And you can see here, this is from the paper, DNA from the men, however, all traced back to the steps. The Y chromosomes from the male farmers disappeared from the gene pool. And this is a puzzle. Um, and they, 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 uh, the researchers here rule out wars or massacre, it says, uh, because it was not particularly a violent time. Well, if you see the um, uh, petroglyphs, the rock, many rock carvings in Scandinavia in the Bronze Age, I beg to differ. Or if you've seen Heilung and their uh, great music video uh, of the band Heilung, which is called Kriksgalder. Galder, that's the old Viking word for, um, um, it's a little bit magical, but to, to I guess, uh, sing or talk or proclaim and the uh, Krieg is, is, is war, right? Kriegskalder. You can see there, they put animations to the, some of the more famous rock carvings. Uh, it looks kind of violent. But anyway, 100% um, of the men disappeared. And it's not entirely correct, I'll show you now, but uh, still, the paper shows 100%. So in the British Isles in uh, and, and Ireland, uh, the number is 90% of the men disappeared. In Spain and uh, Portugal, Iberia, the number is 100%. And that's kind of crazy. I just want to show you from the paper on the left here because it's really cool the way you can see they're trying to animate migrations here from north to south. And of course, the, this is the reconquest of Spain by the Christians, the Visigoths, uh, mostly Visigothic nobles like Pelayo who went down south. But they went uh, really distinct, as you can see here. And uh, for all you Portuguese, I spoke with uh, this one person from uh, with Portugal, Portuguese um, ancestry, and he was curious about this. You see the Kingdom of Leon here, and this is uh, remnants of the Swebi. And as you can see here, the Visigothic nobles were here, coming down further down. That became Spain, and in, in Catalonia, and in Madrid, this region, all the nobles there, the nobility, is mostly from the Visigothic nobles. And they also, of course, as we talked about in all the videos here, intermarried with local aristocracy. So it's a mix. But as you see Portugal here, you see Swebi, the sentence, nobility has come down in this direction. And that's uh, probably, I, I, I speak a little Portuguese, if I follow poco, poquito uh, po, po, Portuguese. I'm not going to do that now. I, I lived in Brazil for a while and all the Portuguese people tell me not to talk Portuguese because I talk this Brazilian Portuguese. But anyway, um, this may be a little bit uh, regarding the roots or the difference between the Portuguese and the Spanish languages. Could have something to do with Swabia, actually. That would have been interesting to find out. But... I talked about 90% on the British Isles and 100% in Iberia, but not in Scandinavia. The farmers and the, from the Neolithic and also the hunter-gatherers, they, um, it seems to be a bottleneck here also, a genetic bottleneck, meaning a few people held stance, had some resistance for whatever reason they evolved and, and maybe they became or copied or adapted or had the same clan culture to some degree. They were able to defend themselves in Sweden and Norway, uh, more so in Sweden, obviously, uh, because the coast of Norway here, and especially middle Norway, that's where you find the most um, Indo-European uh, um, ancestry among present day people and people haven't changed uh, that much geographically in uh, the coast of Norway because of all the mountains. But it's interesting, something happened in Scandinavia. And this is one of the secrets of the Gamalai tribes because this was at the start of the Bronze Age. And as I told you, Scandinavia in the Bronze Age was, was the richest region in Europe, uh, let's say one of the richest, but, uh, and they had lots of contact with the Minoan Greeks and, and the Mykonos, uh, Mykonian Greeks. Um, in, in the Bronze Age, there were a lot of trade here, large mm -hmm. and enormous trading networks here because of the trade down in Corn, uh, sorry, the tin down in Cornwall and bronze from, uh, from present day Spain and Austria and, 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 and Italy. And uh, um, so they had contacts. We know in, in German, present day Germany, uh, there's a paper, I maybe should write that up here also. Why are daughters missing from German? Uh, noble graves in the Bronze Age. Well, they sent their daughters away and married them off 350 kilometers away even because that's where they found their daughters. 
in other graves really far, far away. And that's, um, I said this in another video also, the word for gift and to get married still in Scandinavia is the same word. And also to take poison, by the way. I don't know if that has anything to do with it. But um, this was a time when you married off your offspring your, uh, in, in very strategically and to keep these extensive trading networks. And as we shall uh, see in my next video, uh, there are a lot of other secrets here and how much, how many connections there are between the um, Germanic tribes, the Vikings, and also the Bronze Age civilization of the Scandinavia. And that's really cool. Let me show you the I here. So this is the haplogroup I1 right uh north in europe and and you see also down here in, in italy and you find different regions here where you have a lot of it also in russia um and this is taken from Arpedia. it's not entirely precise it's not updated that well either but it's good for reference and here is i2 and i1 both haplogroups uh, together so you can see here there's um especially Sardinia is interesting. They seem to have survived other places also with the onslaught of the Indo-Europeans. But as you can see, 90% and 100% were the numbers here. As you can see, probably the Basques, uh, some, some uh, survived of the Y DNA in the Basque populations. And this in the Balkans, as I told you, with, um, with uh, the Herals and, and the Orheruli and other tribes. A lot of the Gonic tribes settled down here, so there's a lot of genetic um, uh, common ancestry between present-day Scandinavia and the Balkans. Uh, so so um, it could have been later, some of this also. But these are mostly the farmers, just so you know. G, the Hopler, Y Hopler group G. And these are the ones who... Um, suffered greatly when the Europeans came in, as we can see. Not like the ice, there's a difference here between the ice. Uh, the ice have it, it looks like, and not the Gs in, the, in, the, in this, um, what happened in the early or, or pre-Bronze Age when the Europeans started coming in. It could have been plague, it could have been something to do with the way the farmers in the Neolithic era had um, were more based whilst the uh, people in Scandinavia were more hunter-gatherers and were able to, well, they lived in smaller communities, perhaps, and traveled uh, more or in better shape, probably, also. And they didn't have these extremely large uh, cities uh, that you could find 20, 40,000 people down here in Eastern Europe. And and uh, that caused a lot of plague and stuff like that. So it could have... I, I suspect it was an entire, um, entirely... Uh, conquer and, and 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 warfare and, and that kind of stuff that the Europeans did and it could have been advantage uh, advantages how do you say that well i'm not english sorry but it could be to an advantage to come into europe if after a plague for example so um the g the the yg the the um, iceman utzi uh, have um, the one who was found uh, mummified in the ice his Y DNA is uh, is of G, for example. I just wanted to show a cool photo of him and all the sixty-one tattoos. Not really cool tattoos, anyway. But yeah, I put the link down there also. So yeah, um, I think this is important to understand when we talk about the Germanic tribes and when we're talking about this map here. There, something happened in the centuries before, and there's a mix here. Because these Indo-European tribes, they would mix with their eyes uh, and, and not go about like they did in the British Isles, on uh, Iberia and other places. So this is very interesting to know. We don't know what happened or how, but uh, I suspect some of the eyes were, um, I'm talking about the Y DNA haplogroup I1 that we see a center of in present day uh, Jötaland, the Gotland. Um, and some in Finland and some in Norway and Denmark also, of course. They were able to protect themselves. They seem to have assimilated. And we also see in, in, in some of the research papers uh, some uh, natural selection here also on, on height, for example, and, and color and lactose tolerance. It's, it's quite intriguing and we'll know more in just a few years, uh, I'm certain, because I know of some of the projects that goes on here. So in order to understand the map on the left, 
or the map on the middle. We need to know a little bit about the past and we need to, well, to understand these two maps together to get to where we were in the Viking Age. That's sort of what I was trying to say. And uh, we do have, I wanted to take out something to finish off now with um, this uh, book, uh, Germania from Tacitus. Um, that's how I pronounce his name. He was a politician and a, and a historian in the Roman Empire in the first century of our um, timeline. And, and uh, this is probably why we call it the Germanic tribes, why this, this, this name, Germanic. But mind you, both Germanic and Skans or Scandinavian uh, didn't come that early. So uh, we need to understand this. And Tacitus was also the man who wrote about Mannerbunde. And uh, he called it, of course, in Latin, comitatus, which means a uh, band of um, uh, protectors, um, a, um, a warrior band who are protecting someone. And in order to understand a little bit about the Germanic tribes and why they were so successful in warfare, it was it had something to do with, with, with um, the way they were organized in this warrior code, the Germanic warrior code, which is very similar to the Viking warrior code. And the same, as I said, the way many of these Germanic tribes traveled out and settled and married into local aristocracy and controlled, uh, it's very similar to the way the Vikings went out, like to, the Norm to Normandy and in Southern Italy and the Rus Vikings. There are so many similarities here. And it's really difficult if you don't look at Vikings and warrior, as, as crazy warriors full of uh, mushrooms and uh, rapists and stuff like that. But instead, look at them as tradesmen, uh, settlers and, and uh, travelers, migrants. Um, there's really not that much distinction except for what happened in the 6th century with the uh, plague and climate, severe climate change, change the Fimbul winter, the three-year winter. And this I'll talk about in another video. But there is a line here going from the Mannerbunde Comitatus to the Viking warrior code and down through Normandy to the chivalry code, right? The time of chivalry. And it continues with virtues and deeds and honor. This is all what you find in Hovamal, the great poem of the tall one um, from uh, Odin himself, supposedly. And, and it's even connected what became the gentleman in the 14th, 15th, 16th century, a gentleman's noble conduct. It's all connected in the red line, at least in my head. And even Hegel, the philosopher in the early 19th century, he wrote about the master-slave dialectic and this consciousness. Can you have a self-consciousness? And he talked about this how people are dependent on other people in, 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 in order to have a kind of self-consciousness. It's dependent on the perspective or, or perceptance you have of what another person thinks about you. It's, uh, well, you can call it, I think, it, I don't want to criticize Hegel too much because I'd be criticizing the whole of Western European philosophy in the same uh, breath. But uh, I think he was thinking a little bit too, um, well, if you had known what we know today and, and use history in, in this way that I'm talking about now, and if you know how oxytocin and those kind of hormones can work collectively, uh, us against each other, uh, against the, sorry, not us against each other, but us against the others, um, one can understand really much about how strong this chivalric warrior code that the Vikings had, that the Varangians had, that the Normans had, the, the different tribes of the Germanic tribes had, the warrior bands. Um, in German, it's called Herrschaft und Knechtschaft. In Norwegian, um, Herrschgir und Knecht, uh, Knechtskap, and uh, Lord and Knight. I think um, this is important because uh, Hegel's uh, master and slave dialectic was uh, very, very important and influential in the 19th and 20th century centuries uh, of philosophy and Marxism and lots of important early um, influential uh, historical and philosophical directions 
So uh, I see a line going all the way back here to the Bronze Age, actually, but it's difficult to say what happened between the Bronze and Iron Ages, but we do know a lot about the Germanic tribes, so it's important to know. And, and the, even in Italy, the Normans, I talk about this in the, the Italy video, the Sicily video, uh, this um, to give your life to a princess, you know, the most noble thing you can do. And uh, as uh, many young people today know, you, you work, have you seen when Mario gets the princess in the end? She just moves on, you know, he kind of go, oh man, I got to start over. And he never gets the princess, but it doesn't matter. That's part of the uh, noble conduct. That's part of, you don't want to get the princess. You want to give your life to the princess. That's the whole point. That's the whole warrior code, you know? Yeah, there, I also made a video a year ago, by the way, on the, the, the uh, Nefertafel, the table game that the Vikings played, but also that goes all the way back to the fourth century. So the Germanic tribes played that also. And you should check that video out if you can, because I talk about how, I mean, even children play this to learn how to give your life for the king, because that's all what this um, board game is all about, Nefa Tafel. You know, you give your life to protect the king. And, and of course, chess is what continued after that. So I hope that's. Um, not too much information. There's a long list of uh, links down below uh, now. So you can check that out if you want. But please, if you want to have some more exclusive content on expedition stories and other things, go to my Patreon page and check it out. I'd be very happy for that. And um, all I can say is thanks for your time. It's been a pleasure.